of the presentation. Tonight's presenter, Mr. Burton, is a David Falk Professor of Sport Management at Syracuse University and the author or co-author of numerous books. He writes on the sports business for Sports Business Journal and Sportico and has had numerous historical pieces published by the New York Times over the last 20 years. He was also the commissioner of Australia's National Basketball League and chief marketing officer for the US Olympic Committee during the 2008 Beijing Summer Olympics. Rick, welcome, thanks for being here and I'm gonna pass it off to you now. Well, Tom, thank you so very much. And uh, hello, everybody. I, I feel like I could be doing a, a Vin Scully or a John Sterling impersonation uh, because in its own way, this is almost like radio. And I think that it's, uh, it's funny that I'm here giving a presentation to you on your community, which I think most of you will know far better than I will now or ever will. Um, and I thank you for being here tonight because I think you could be watching the Yankees game, which is just coming on now. And with the way they've been playing lately, you'd be curious as to whether or not they're going to make the playoffs. Um, but it, it's, it's going to be fun for me to be here with you. And I'm hoping to take what I had written for the Mammoth timeline, timeline uh, and make that come a little bit more to life uh, through some of the slides that I've prepared for you. And uh, hopefully uh, we can get to a question and answer session at the end. I'd like to go about 40 minutes, just in case you're watching your own clocks and uh, come to that point where I say those two magical words in conclusion. And, and that will give you an indication that I'm pretty close to wrapping up. Um, anyways, I started with the, with the skull and crossbones. And uh, Tom, just let me confirm that you think everybody can see the slides comfortably on their screens? I'm not seeing them, Rick. You're not? No. Okay, so I need to find out what I'm doing wrong here. Um, hang on, I'm, I'm probably pushing all of the wrong buttons. Um, so what are you seeing? Have, we, have I stopped sharing my screen? Let me, let me stop mine and uh, why don't you try again? Because I have up on my screen a PowerPoint presentation that I've put together for the group. Yeah, you gotta go to the, uh, the share screen button. Okay, so hang on just a minute, everyone. And I apologize um, for this. Uh, what's happened here is I'm not in Zoom, I don't think. Um, all right, so let's go to sharing the screen. Let's go to that. And how's yep. that now? Is that better? Yeah, if you can just make it full screen, that'd be great. How's that? Yep, yep that's it. Great. All right. Well, thank you again. And apologies for that uh, brief interruption. Um, what I thought I'd do was was just back up a moment before we start talking about Monmouth County or start talking about Captain Kidd and his reputation or William Leeds Jr., son of William Leeds Sr. I just thought that I would uh, warmly uh, reference what I imagine is almost everyone's enjoyment of pirates. And, and we've got a long history with pirates. Their, their famous era is, is really the late 17th century and the early 18th century. But in popular culture, uh, dating now from the late 19th century with books like Treasure Island, Pirates have been pretty popular, and uh, they serve us, I think, in a lot of different ways. And so I, I thought I'd just pull together some of the, the more interesting ones to me. Treasure Island, written by Robert Louis Stevenson uh, during the 1881 to 83 period. Um, Peter Pan will be done by Mr. Barry, uh, and it's, it's a serial uh, originally kind of constructed across 1904 to 1911, but it, it introduces us to the very famous Captain Hook. By the early 1930s or mid 1930s, we're seeing Errol Flynn playing a pirate in Captain Blood. 10 years later, Charles Lawton will do the same in a movie called Captain Kidd. Uh, you've got the Pirates of Penzance, which is a comic opera about pirates 
written in 1879 or first performed around that time, uh, later made into a movie in 1983. Hook is a revisiting of Peter Pan, but done with Robin Williams in 1991. Johnny Depp has made millions with the Pirates of the Caribbean movie franchise, uh, drawn originally from the, the Disney amusement park um, I guess property would be the right way to, to state it. And many of you will have been to the Disney properties and would be familiar with the Pirates of the Caribbean. And even a modern telling of pirates can be seen with uh, the movie Captain Phillips with Tom Hanks, which was done in 2013 about Somalian pirates off the coast of us, uh, um, Africa. Uh, I thought I would, I'd just throw up some visuals because it's a lot more interesting than looking at words. And, and here you have some of the images, um, the ones I'm gonna call out here, Treasure Island in comic book form. Some of you might've read Classics Illustrated, uh, Goonies, um, the very uh, underwhelming movie, the pirate movie. Um, but you see Captain Blood, Captain Kidd, Captain Phillips, Captain Hook, Captain Morgan. Um, these are all uh, you know, great moments in popular culture, I think to some degree. And um, we celebrate, celebrate pirates with regularity. Um, I then asked kind of myself um, why it was that, as I call it, why pirates rule. And I think it's easy enough for most of us to probably agree that pirates represent rebellion against some level of authority, but incrementally they provide us with adventure, uh, swashbuckling tales, um, we believe that pirates are actively involved with buried treasure. Uh, actually, very few, if almost none of them, uh, buried it. Kidd is reported to have buried treasure around Gardner's Island, and I think that was just so rich that it provided us with the belief that all pirates buried treasure, when in fact uh, most of the research suggests that they didn't. Um, it gives us some historical nostalgia in the sense that we can try to point backwards 300 or so years ago. But as I like the, um, the symmetry of the words, it can also give us some hysterical nostalgia, which is um, most evident with the whole Pirates of the Caribbean uh, movie franchise. Um, either way, you kind of get history or you get fun. Um, and more often than not, I think uh, people are, are laughing up their sleeves um, imagining either what it would have been like to have been a pirate uh, or that none of these things could have possibly happened. Uh, we get violence, uh, which in my background in sports, uh, we know that violence plays well, uh, particularly in America. Uh, we get great outfits. Um, and, and certainly I was going to put up um, some pictures of costume pirate costumes that people can buy and, and people do buy. And with Halloween really not that far away, um, I would recommend all of you think of going as pirates uh, if you're lucky enough to be invited to a costume party during a pandemic. And then the, the last piece that makes me laugh is just that the facts may not matter. And, and in fact, they rarely do. Um, jokingly, I can say it's because dead men tell no tales. Uh, but I also think it's because it's so hard to prove who did what to who and where they did it. Um, and therefore, we end up with um, a lot of fiction or pseudo history um, that I just think is so much fun to play with. Um, and when I started working with John Barrows from the timeline, uh, I think one of the things that was most enjoyable was you could go almost anywhere with a Captain Kid myth. Um, and I, I wrote an email to John at one point, and I, I suggested that I had been in Maine, um, and there was a, I, I went into, I was um, in one of those small coastal towns that probably has a lighthouse, uh, at the very least, it had a tourist shop, and uh, I went in, and of course, there was a pirate book there, and the pirate book suggested that Captain Kidd had been in Maine. And I think I sent John an email saying, he's everywhere, Captain Kidd in Maine, Captain Kidd in New Jersey, Captain Kidd in Trinidad. Uh, and, and so it was just wonderful um, timing, coincidence that I was in Maine and here was Captain Kidd on display. And they had a pirate book that I could have bought. And uh, 
I held off. Um, I also think that pirates are pretty good for commerce. Uh, we've seen this um, certainly over the years. I grabbed a couple of images. Captain Crunch um, has battled pirates. Pirate's booty, uh, which Mrs. Burton uh, does eat. The pirate blaster. Um, the previously mentioned Captain Morgan. Uh, Legoland has Pirate Island. This is beautiful. And, and of course, a little bit closer to home in Cliffwood Beach, um, you actually had a building for a number of years that was built in the shape of a pirate ship, um, ultimately uh, sold off. But there was a time when it had a mast and it had rigging. And as you drove down the road, you wondered about what kinds of things you might buy uh, in such a building. Um, so they're good for, for commerce. Um, I also think they're pretty good for leadership training. And I actually teach a, a leadership class at Syracuse University. And uh, I've just always loved this expression. It's politically incorrect now, um, but it, it serves us in the belief that pirate captains um, could virtually do almost anything to their crew or to the citizens of the small villages that they uh, anchored uh, just offshore from. And uh, this concept of the beatings will continue until morale improves. Uh, it, it actually serves us until you realize that Captain Kidd um, probably ended up getting hung in London um, for what's been put down as the murder of one of his crewmen. Now, the, the myth and the legend and the facts is that captains could make people walk the plank, um, that they could keel haul individuals, which was um, dragging their body um, essentially down one side of the boat, uh, across the bottom of the hull and up the other side. Um, traditionally, you died of drowning, but if you didn't die of drowning, you were scraped to death by the barnacles on the bottom of the boat. Um, if you didn't die from drowning or from the cuts from the barnacles, by the time you got back up to the other side, um, you were going to die anyways. Um, so I, I think that it's, it's great in its own way that we have this belief that uh, you had a, a total dictatorship in the form of pirate captains or even uh, British naval captains. Um, and, and of course, we know a lot about how poorly sailors were treated um, in almost anyone's Navy uh, over the course of the last 300 years, uh, and that a lot of times people spent time in brigs. Uh, we know of crews that mutinied. Uh, we get Captain Bly. We get the bounty. Um, we have men set adrift uh, with lots of beautiful things, and so I couldn't resist uh, not showing you that one slide. Um, so you might be asking, at least I hope some of you are, how a sport management professor at Syracuse University who worked on the Olympics and in professional basketball ended up as a pirate expert uh, or a William Leeds Jr. expert or a Middletown, New Jersey expert. And the short answer is he didn't. And, and I think many of you who are part of this Zoom tonight uh, are probably far, far more informed um, both historically and in terms of the accuracy of what I'm about to talk about um, than I am. Uh, so I, I appreciate your um, willingness to allow me to expound on these topics, uh, but I also want to respect uh, your historical knowledge and your familiarity with much of what I'll cover. Um, but for those of you who aren't history professors or aren't um, died in the wool historians, armchair historians, pseudo historians. Um, my hope is that I can give you um, um, the best facts that I could uh, ascertain from the materials that I was able to go through. Um, a lot of thanks um, in what I, I guess published is maybe the wrong word, what was published on my behalf as the writer um, with the uh, timeline is really due to my friendship with John Barrows, who I think is doing a spectacular job with the timeline uh, and consistently presenting really exciting, what I think anyways, is exciting uh, history uh, from Monmouth County. Uh, and I know that he's, he's done the, the mobsters, the Genovese, um, he's done submarines, he's done pirates. Um, I just think it's a really intriguing timeline and and I'm so grateful to him for the amount of time he's put into curating 
that website. And, and I think giving the people of Monmouth County uh, something to look forward to each day as he presents kind of this day in, in Monmouth County history. Um, I previously uh, wrote for him uh, about a World War II submarine that uh, was sunk off the coast of, of Monmouth County. Um, it was actually a very unknown, uh, and I encourage you to go to the timeline to find the story because I think it's another um, piece of history that a lot of people didn't know about, um, really brought to life by Rob Curson, and I'm in, in indebted to him for his book, Shadow Divers, and, and actually some kindness that he showed me after I contacted him for uh, my work on, on this submarine. It was actually a German submarine um, that they believe uh, may have sunk itself with a torpedo that circled around it and came back in on itself, uh, or that it was sunk as was claimed by the US Navy um, by a shore patrol um, during the later stages of World War II. Uh, really quite a mystery because when the early scuba divers were able to get into the submarine, no one had any indication that the sub was there, so they didn't know whose it was. And, and when they got into the sub, they couldn't figure out which sub it was. Um, so a story for some of you who are fascinated by World War II history on the Monmouth County timeline. Um, I also had a, a slight knowledge, a really slight knowledge of, of Captain Kidd's association with Trinity Church in uh, Manhattan. I happen to be an Episcopalian and uh, have attended services at Trinity Church. And I think they, had at one time a display or at least a recognition that Captain Kidd uh, actually assisted with the building of the church in 1696. And this was one of the first places that I started my presentation or my, my research because William Leeds Jr. was going to get baptized uh, in an Episcopal or Anglican church in, in the early 1700s. And I, and I found that kind of fascinating that here was a wealthy guy in in Monmouth County in, in, in Middletown who was being linked to Kidd and he was an Episcopalian uh, or at least taking on the mantle of, of, of being an Episcopalian. And Kidd had been an, an Episcopalian or had been tied to Trinity Church. And, and I thought, wonder if there's gonna be linkage. Um, so I was intrigued to, to see if I could put together um, a linkage. And I think that many of you will know that historians, and these are the, I think the lesser ones, and I'm one of them, um, sometimes will go out and look for linkage when it's not really there. Um, in fact, they want the linkage to be there because that's going to make it an interesting story. Yeah, and I did that on actually some research that I published about Stephen Crane, who actually was born in New Jersey and, and lived in New Jersey during the time that he wrote what I think a lot of people consider his seminal novel, The Red Badge of Courage. And he attended Syracuse University, and I knew he played baseball there. So you can see my similarity, kids and, a, kids and Episcopalian, and he went to Trinity Church. I'll start digging there. Um, and I wanted to write something about Stephen Crane and baseball. And I started with The Red Badge of Courage and went looking for baseball in that book. Um, it's really not there, but in the process, I discovered a lot of other things um, that allowed my research to flourish. But for those of you who are historians, it, it really is bad form to go in with a set agenda and say, I'm going to prove this because um, you bring a bias to your research. And I think everyone who, who does historical research for a living knows that all too well. Um, a couple of basic facts um, as we kind of plow through this. Um, Leeds Sr. and then Jr. lived in Middletown, uh, which I think the best of you know earned a, a sullied reputation as featuring perhaps, perhaps the most ignorant and wicked people in the world. Love that. Um, wish the little village that I lived in in upstate New York had that reputation. Um, but you guys have it. And I tip my hat to you for at least having developed it I imagine across the late 1600s and very much tied to your proximity to Raritan Bay, which everyone would know has been a, a place that ships have harbored uh, really for the last 400 years. Um, it is a place that um, you can get into any number of small coves. 
uh, and get up on in the old days uh, onto some pretty pristine beaches. And um, for pirate ships, for frigates, for merchant ships, uh, when you're being hit by a, a hurricane or hit by gale force winds, uh, being able to come into kind of the lee side of, of any kind of storm or the lee side of traditionally it would be islands, but in, in this case, um, the nature of Raritan Bay lends itself, uh, I think, to protection. Um, we know that Captain Kidd was briefly based in the New York City vicinity. Um, uh, I, I point out here 1691 to 95. He was there before then. He was there as a young man, but went away back to England. Um, and, and so there's a four-year period where he is uh, a merchant uh, or, or, or a wealthy uh, individual with access to sailing ships. Um, and he sailed the east coast of North America until 1699. Um, that holds up as, as, I think, being factually safe. Um, but as Mark Hanna has written, and, and I owe a lot of credit to Mark and, and his work, and he actually responded to uh, the timeline, a lot of what's known about pirates is not true, and a lot of what is true is not known. It's such a, such a great sentence, um, and, and I think that we have to hold on to that for the rest of this presentation because uh, we're working with research that we believe we can trust, but it actually takes a lot more work to go back and dig into the research as it's published uh, and find out if uh, what we're dealing with is true or is just simply unknown. Um, and and I'll, this is not the in conclusion statement, but I think it's probably pretty safe to say that I was not able to find any single legitimate source or evidence that Captain Kidd ever met anyone from the Leeds family. Uh, it's just not documented anywhere that I can find it. Um, I do encourage historians to continue looking for it. Um, but so far, we haven't found that that scrap of paper hidden in the attic of someone's house or hidden behind a painting um, that uh, would, you know, once and for all prove that Leeds and Kidd uh, were cohorts. Um, I think some of you who read the piece that I did for the timeline would know that Leeds Sr. inherited land from his father, Thomas, and he would buy more. This is around the 1670s, specifically 1679. Uh, five years later, he and Daniel Applegate would buy land in the Lincroft area, and they would buy that from the um, local Native American tribe, uh, on whose land, I might add, um, Middletown now, now stands. And, and, and so there's um, a, an obvious um, obligation, I think, to honor um, the Native people, the Indigenous people on whose land all of New Jersey sits. But uh, in this case, Leeds Sr. and Daniel Applegate bought the land, um, and they really bought it for um, cloth, what's, what was called duffels um, and rum, uh, and the deal uh, included payment in rum um, until 1999, um, which is fascinating. I, I rather doubt that uh, anyone in the Leeds family kept paying um, the local community in rum, but uh, anyways, that was part of the deal as it was at least recorded. 1694, uh, 10 years after um, that property purchase, uh, Leeds Sr. gave Leeds Jr. Uh, just under 200 acres. Um, and, and in this window of time, uh, William Leeds Jr.'s new wife, uh, Rebecca, is actually Daniel Applegate's widow. Uh, and so she will bring some land with her. And, and it's safe to say that by the early 1700s, Leedsville or the Leeds land holdings uh, are quite significant. Um, and this is a wealthy family that dates back really to uh, the earliest days of the American colonies. When we look back on William Leeds Sr. getting his land from Thomas, um, we're not talking about the United States existing. You were still uh, roughly 100 years in 1679 uh, from the Declaration of Independence in, in July 4th and the Continental Congress and things like that. So this is really the early days of, of North America as it is um, at least recorded by uh, 
Western historians. I, I think we can do a much better job of recognizing how long um, the indigenous people had been on this land, but that's not tonight's presentation. Um, Kid, just to, to skip relatively quickly through this, uh, born in 1655, um, it's disputed whether it was Dundee, England, possibly Scotland, um, settled in New York City as a young man that would put him uh, for the sake of this story in uh, New York City in the late 1660s. Um, but he would be sailing with an English-French crew by 1689, and he would take his captaincy, if that's the right word, or captainship. He would become the captain of the Blessed William in 1689. Uh, he would marry uh, a twice-widowed young woman in her 20s in 1691, and her wealth uh, would do much to give Captain Kidd the ability to move um, in the in the naval channels that that he uh, loved, um, he was a sailor already, and now he's married to a wealthy woman, and this creates the opportunity for him um, to think about the kinds of boats that he wants to purchase. And and anyone who lives near the Jersey Shore uh, is familiar with friends who have bought really big boats, and I think that that's been the purview of wealthy people um, for hundreds of years. Um, he transitions, though, from a merchant to a privateer, um, a hunter of pirates, between 1691 and 1695. This is still an honorable um, job, if you want to call it that, or, or an honorable uh, pursuit of generating income. Uh, and his pirate years really won't take place uh, until 1695 to 1699, and really very late in that period. Um, you'll see that my 1695s overlap, and, and Kid, were he with us today, would have claimed his innocence um, probably well into 1698. Um, he's captured in 1699 in Boston. He's betrayed by the governor up there, uh, and ultimately taken back to England where he'll be executed in May of 1701. Um, there's some uh, fanciful images of Captain Kidd that um, have uh, made their way into any number of books and easily pulled down off various websites, uh, Google being my website of choice, but uh, portraiture on the left, him theoretically wooing or being courteous uh, to a young woman in the center and then uh, being hung over the Thames and left there, gibbeted um, for a while to uh, discourage others from becoming pirates. He proclaimed his innocence uh, to the end, uh, which is, I think, consistent with a lot of people um, who believe they're innocent. Um, Leeds and Kidd. Uh, for the two men to conspire, my belief is that they would have had to have met between 1689 and 1699, so really only about a 10-year period. Logically, in Middletown, where Leeds um, had uh, his wealth and his land, um, but possibly in the New York City area, we can't rule out that Leeds might have gone into New York City, um, or that Kidd could have come into Raritan Bay. But again, we have no proof that they ever met. We just know that for it to have happened, it logically would have happened during that 10 year period. Um, Leeds was wealthy, we've covered that. And he might have met Kidd during the time the captain was sailing as a legitimate merchant or employed privateer, but probably not as a hunted pirate. Uh, I don't believe, and then this is conjecture on my part, but I don't believe that Kid could have really lingered uh, very long after he was on the run. Um, we know that Leeds' wealth was inherited um, and that one of the pieces that makes this interesting is more or less this belief that when Leeds gets ready to die and, and it makes the decision to donate land to the church, to Christ Church, um, after his baptism in 1703, that this was done because he was trying to wipe clean his slate of, of having been associated with Kidd. I think the, the more logical fact is that he and Rebecca married in their 40s and they had no children uh, and there was no one in his family to leave 
his wealth to, or if there was, it wasn't a direct lineage. Um, and because he had uh, become a devout Christian, um, he felt comfortable enough making a donation uh, to his local church. Um, we get a different, a different piece, um, which is Leeds and Moses Butterworth in 1701. Now, this is before Leeds is baptized, but in 1701, shortly before Kidd's execution in London, a Monmouth County militia rescues and frees a court-held prisoner named Moses Butterworth, who is acknowledged to have sailed with Kidd. Uh, and as Mark Hanna wrote, this action was not unknown. Local political leaders openly protected men, and I suppose women, who committed acts of piracy against powers that were nominally allied or at peace with England. Colonists, uh, and remember this is the early 1700s, wanted to prevent depositions proving they had harbored pirates or purchased their goods. Um, and, and so there was some pushback against England, which was having an increasingly difficult time managing these colonists, um, many who had come seeking religious freedom, uh, but it was just very difficult for England to supervise them because of the distance and the length of time it took to get from England to the North American coast. So one of the questions has to be, was Leeds Jr. a part of the militia that came in and rescued Moses Butterworth? The answer is possibly, but I think it, it's logical to ask why in light of Kidd's coming death, because um, Kidd had already been captured in 1699 and had already been sent to England. Um, it's really questionable that one of the most wealthy men in New Jersey would risk association with Butterworth, a common pirate. In other words, it doesn't make sense to me, and it may not make sense to you, that an incredibly wealthy man would be part of the mob that would go down to the courthouse because he'd be immediately identifiable as Leeds Jr., one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest man in the area. Uh, and that would taint his reputation, which, you know, essentially, if you think about a mafia don, um, you don't need to be seen for your influence to be known. Um, so I don't believe that Leeds Jr. would have been a part of that militia, uh, although I, I reserve for you the right to say yes, but he could have sent his people on his behalf. Um, we don't know that, so you're going to have to have your own conjecture on that. Uh, Leeds Jr. in Christ Church, um, first recorded service at Christ Church doesn't happen until 1702, uh, and it's the first Episcopal church in Monmouth County. Um, Leeds Jr. and his sister will be baptized there in January of 1703, um, so sh shortly after the church opens up for business, um, if you believe that churches are in business, slight aside. Uh, he'll make his donation of land in 1732. I think he knows at that time he's kind of coming to the end of his life, and, and that donation, what the land will do is the land will provide uh, crops, and those crops will help pay the rector's salary at Christ Church. Um, seems honorable to leave land, and, and back in the 1700s, um, because we were largely an agrarian society, we were not yet an industrial one, you needed that land uh, to produce revenue, um, and that's part of how Christ Church was actually able to pay the rector. Uh, Leeds Jr. dies in 1739. He's buried in Lincroft, uh, but he's later removed, dug up, uh, and reburied in Shrewsbury. Uh, and there may be some of you who are familiar with um, the picture. I, I would hold up the book, but would be familiar with the picture and the hidden history of Monmouth County uh, of that um, monolith. I guess that might be the right word that it's not really a statue. So the monument, I guess, the memorial um, that exists uh, there in, in your community. Um, so here's where it gets interesting, um, and, and John Barrows really worked me over on this, um, and, and much to his credit and much to my good fortune, um, much of why we link uh, Leeds and Kidd um, is tied to a single book that was written in 1927, uh, generated at Christ Church Middletown by its rector, Ernest Mandeville, um, who wanted to pen a book that celebrated Middletown and, and actually celebrated his church. And, and he was a bit of a journalist. 
and so he wrote this book, Middletown, the Oldest Settlement in New Jersey. It isn't. Uh, I think some of you will know that, but it sounded good. Um, and then he actually told in the book, he said, listen, I, I didn't get a chance to do a lot of research. Uh, the anniversary was coming up. Um, we had to go to press. Um, so we put together everything we could find. Uh, and this book, therefore, is a compendium of kind of history and folklore. He might not have used those exact words. Um, but listen, I'm running out of time. So I'm going to throw all this stuff together and we'll see what sticks. Um, and ultimately, Mandeville uh, included a chapter called Pirate Days in Middletown. That's a great title for a chapter. And he claimed that there was sufficient historical data to, or data, depending on how you like to say the word, to make positive many of Captain Kidd's pirate crews spent considerable town in Middletown. And I think this goes back to the town being a wicked place. Um, and I tip my hat to you guys for having that claim. Um, he then goes on to make the claim that Leeds Jr. was a chief cohort. So that's an unfortunate linkage for the dead man, now dead more than 150 years. Um, but it gives Middletown linkage to the pirates. And, and, and here, if you'll pardon my sarcasm, or maybe it's my cynicism, I go, shock, horror. But the good news is instant fame. And eight years later in 1935, possibly around the same time as Captain Blood uh, with Errol Flynn, the New York Times appeared to buy into or rely on Mandeville's book. And they stated that bloodshed and crime of more than two centuries ago was now paying the salary, the rector of Christ Protestant Episcopal Church at Middletown. So um, our, our myth and our legend are, are really nicely bundled for us uh, by uh, an old Episcopalian in 1927. Um, so I'm going to start to wrap up, um, but ask, you know, did Kid and Leeds, <laughs> did Leeds and Kid Jr., no, did Leeds Jr. and Kid ever meet? Um, many books, such as The Pirates of New Jersey, have suggested they did. Um, I'm going to tell you that I believe that that's pseudo history. Um, in the Hidden History of Monmouth County, page 71, our authors Gefkin and Smith note that the Leeds' home and furnishings were apparently so much grander than their neighbors that many speculated about the source of Leeds Jr.'s income, and rumors circulated that Leeds had been an associate of Kid. Some thought Leeds knew of Kid's buried treasure, knew of its location in the vicinity of Middletown. And then they, they kind of wrapped up page 71 by saying, contrary to the pirate myth, which has been debunked, Leeds Jr. was an ardent churchgoer. Um, so I think if you did have an ardent churchgoer, although maybe he wasn't as churchy in the late 1600s, he's not baptized until 1703, um, it seems hard to actually you know, stick a fork in it and say that these two men met. Could they have met? Yes. Did they meet? I think it's unlikely. So I go the myth. Leeds Jr.'s wealth was obtained illegally. Uh, Leeds Jr. was an associate and chief cohort of Captain Kidd the pirate, um, as opposed to Captain Kidd the merchant or the privateer. Captain Kidd came to Monmouth County often and buried treasure in Monmouth County, uh, and Leeds Jr. dug up Kidd's treasure. Um, I respond by saying no, 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 and no, uh, but the myth is delicious, and I think it serves us pretty well. Um, pirates in Monmouth County, um, you guys love them, and I can't blame you. So we've got the Red Bank Regional High School mascot is the Buccaneer, Seton Halls is the Pirates, uh, Barnegat celebrates Pirate Days every year. And I think a lot of you have seen folks with metal detectors digging along the, the Bay Shore or in Sandy Hook or on Money Hill or, or, or because wouldn't it be great if that wooden crate stuffed with silver and doubloons and whatever else you have, emeralds, um, is sitting in a sandbank somewhere really close to you. Now we come to what I hope will be those two magical words you were hoping for in conclusion. Um, and I'm going to conclude by saying that I owe a, a great debt of gratitude, as I've mentioned already, to John, probably some old Blackbeard rum, if they still make it. 
at the time, I think it was being made in the Virgin Islands. Um, and, and, and I'm going to say that the timeline's approach to accuracy and facts in what I wrote was particularly uh, gratifying and the editing process really, I think, made uh, the presentation I've just given you, I hope, much more accurate and comprehensive. Um, I think we really did dig into a, a lot of sources and didn't trust many of the ones that, that we worked from. Um, I'd love to take some questions and, and give you what I call questionable answers. Um, but my thanks to Tom and Randall for their stewardship of tonight's presentation, uh, and also to uh, my assistant at Syracuse University, Margie Chetney, who every day makes me look far better than I really am. So um, that's my last slide, as I recall. And um, Tom, I'm going to turn it back to you and see whether or not I can get back to kind of the, the main screen. Okay, Rick, thanks a lot. That was excellent. Um, so if anybody has any questions, please enter it into the chat window. We'll try to get to it. And uh, Rick, I actually have one while we wait for some questions to come in. Um, sure. When I, when I was doing a little bit of research, uh, I saw a couple of references to uh, Captain Kidd's wife, Sarah, as uh, coming from a Middletown or Monmouth County family. Did you run into that at all? Yeah, I looked at it a little bit, and I, I think it was it started to take me away from um, the story. She's generally um, associated with New York City, um, but I didn't go down that particular rabbit hole to see if her, you know, if her origins, her, you know, her birthplace uh, was New Jersey. Um, would be a nice little um, <laughs> bringing the circle around, right? If 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 she was. Um, but I don't know that um, she was, and, and I didn't chase it uh, in in depth. Okay. And uh, I assume you've heard about the uh, the legend of Captain Kidd's Cross in Christchurch. I mean, you know, I I I, I love these. Um, yeah, I, I don't think so. Um, you know, it's. Um, it, I, I think it just fits so well with the, you know, the pirate myth with the cutlass. And um, I was in England one time and and um, here's what I'll give you. At some of the old churches in England, they actually have um, sword marks on the out, outside of the church where um, the men used to sharpen their swords before they'd go into battle. Um, but I think that the, the likelihood that uh, kid who was, you know, a pretty accomplished merchant and a pretty wealthy man before he ran out of money at the end, um, was not probably spending his time carving church crosses. Uh, I just, uh, it's a great story, but um, just uh, I can't go there. <laughs> we have a question from uh, Randall. Uh, do you know if uh, Kid's wife survived him? And if she did, did she marry again? Well, she did marry, uh, well, sorry, she did survive him. Uh, there's no evidence that she went to London when they hauled him off. Um, and my sense is, it's, I'm making this up, this is conjecture, but if she had been wealthy and kid had spent all their money, um, I imagine she was pretty mad at him. Uh, Mrs. Burton and I just celebrated 40 years of marriage last weekend. And I believe that if I came home and said, listen, I spent all the cash and they are going to take me to London to hang me. Um, I'm not thinking she crossed the ocean to stand by her man, you know, the Tammy Wynette thing. Um, but I don't know the short answer as to whether or not she married again. It would be great to suggest that she did, that having married three men, um, two of them really wealthy, that if she was still kind of in her early 30s without me being sexist, but recognizing the nuance of the times, um, that she very well could have married and could have possibly married someone who would have provided for her. Um, my guess is, short answer, she did survive kid. I don't know if she married again. Um, am I a descendant of Richard Burton? Um, no, and his real name um, he was born in Wales. His his real surname is not Burton. He assumed that it was uh, the name of his professor um, at school or the name of his teacher. And he 
he liked the teacher and, and he took his teacher's name. His first name, though, was Richard. Um, but I've long been asked that question. And uh, one time going through customs in London, I was asked if I was the bloody bastard son. Um, and uh, I was able to say no. Um, so Melissa says, is that the show where the one brother spends the other brother's fortune? Uh, Melissa, can you expand on that? Um, could Kid have buried his treasure on Oak Island? Um, the only evidence that we have, and Melissa, I'm giving you a chance to give me a little bit more to work from, but the uh, only uh, evidence we have of Kid burying anything anywhere uh, was on Gardner's Island. Um, and that was immediately dug up. Um, but the, uh, the Oak Island show, there's actually a book here on my bookshelf um, which is about burying treasure. I think it's called Riptide. Um, it's just such a great thing to have, um, you know, buried treasure. Gosh, there's nothing better. Um, I actually have a small wooden chest um, that I keep like old clothes in, and I've been very tempted to dump a bunch of pennies in it and dig a hole in my backyard and then tell my children that after I die, there's buried treasure in the backyard and just have them all out there digging. And when they get to it, there'll be $17 in pennies. I think that I could have a great last laugh with that. But uh, I don't think there's any correlation to um, Kid in Oak Island. But it sounds like a good TV show if one brother is abusing the other brother. Rick, do you have any plans on uh, writing anything else at the Mom of the Timeline? Um, I, I've threatened uh, John to do more. Um, I, I love doing the submarine one. Um, I did a piece on um, a family, an Italian, a, a Italian family that really became quite famous for um, their stonework and, and their carvings. And they did things around the Lincoln Memorial and bridges, famous bridges, and um, probably almost every war memorial in, in New Jersey might have been carved by a particular family from Monmouth County. Um, but I'm looking for something juicy and, and something that's sport related, which actually might appear to, to fit my, uh, <laughs> my historical background. Um, but so far I haven't found that next great story. But what I do now when I run into people from New Jersey is I stop them and say, hey, are you from Monmouth County? And they, you know, and sometimes they are. And then I say, do you know any stories that no one else has ever told? Um, which is a little bit like Studs Terkel. If you asked the 50 or so people that are still left on this presentation, if you ask them, do you have any stories? They almost invariably will tell you, well, yeah, we've got all kinds of stories. And, and I think that's what makes the timeline so fun to explore. Any last questions that I can offer up or anything that I missed? We do have one question. Uh, do you happen to know the location of Leeds' Leeds's house? I don't, I, and I apologize. Um, uh, I don't know if it still exists. I mean, I imagine that there may have been multiple properties, um, and I think certainly they they spread over what are now. Uh, I don't know that you'd call them villages, but I think townships or you know the the land when it was um, broken up into different kind of townships or, or communities that um, they probably had outbuildings or secondary buildings that may have been in multiple places. Um, if you can see my screen, I do want to offer up a shout out for Hidden History, um, uh, which I think actually had a pretty even handed approach to Leeds and Kid. Um, and they deserve, I think, uh, uh, Dean and, and Christina Johnson uh, deserve uh, more credit than I do for what I've covered. We actually have one of the authors uh, viewing the presentation tonight, Rick Gefkin. Well, good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I actually sucked up to them while I had the chance. <laughs> All right, Rick. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, if you haven't yet done so, please head on over to mommathetimeline.org and take a look at the uh, article that Rick wrote. It's uh, really interesting. If you enjoyed tonight's presentation, you'll enjoy that as well, definitely. Well, and, and thank you to uh, to everyone who attended tonight. And uh, there's Melissa's bringing in Leedsville Drive. Um, but, but in particular, thanks to Randall and Tom um, for their kindness and allowing me to come and what I hope was a um, 
maybe a little less on the heavy history and a little bit more on uh, trying to make sure that on a beautiful Monday night, everyone had a chance to think about this topic maybe a little differently. All right. Thank you so much. This is really great. Appreciate it. All the best, everyone. Thanks again. Thanks. Good night.